who are united primarily by our respect for the work of Karl Marx and our belief that his work will remain as important for the class struggles of the future as they have been for the, in the past. Um, and again, the programs, we uh, don't reflect any kind of group consensus uh, on the part of the members of the Institute. Um, they represent the facts and opinions of our two speakers, who, for whom we're very grateful for showing up. Uh, the program briefly will have uh, comments by the speakers, lasting roughly the first hour. Um, then we will take a break, uh, and since we are a self-funding organization and get no money from the 1% and their foundations and corporations, we prefer to uh, rely on our people who come here and listen to our talks. So um, be generous uh, when we ask you to fill up our the hat with money, but we'll wait. Uh, and I'm sure you'll want to give us even more after you listen to our speakers. Um, a couple of other little things. Uh, if you have hearing aids, this would be a good time to put them on, in. And if you have cell phones, this would be a good time to turn them off. Turn them off, please. Um, and I'll remind you that this is being uh, recorded and it will be placed on YouTube within the very near future. Um, Usually within a week. And uh, uh, so if you do not want to be recorded, uh, put a sack over your face or something like that. <laughs> okay. So um, I think that pretty well sums it up. We have our two speakers, Tony Ryan and Steve Wasserman. Um, we put their little information on both of them in the blurb, which you probably have somewhere. It was in our reminder. So. Uh, what I will do is turn it over to Tony, who is the organizer of this, to give a fuller introduction to himself and to Steve. Now, I'll just mention that both of our speakers have had expen extensive experience, not only with Cuba, but also with culture, I believe. So uh, they're very well qualified to talk Cul to us Culture today. in general? Is that what you would say? Yeah, in general. Culture. Okay. Yeah, we will save that for the uh, questions at the end. And I just but like, I'll turn it over to you, Steve. I, I just like to ask if uh, if you on the end are uh, find your sight uh, obscured by the camera, I urge you to move more into the. We do have lots of room at the end. Wherever you feel comfortable. Yes. Okay. Okay, it's all yours, Tony. All right, um, I'm Tony Ryan, and I've been involved with uh, Cuba Solidarity for many, many, many years. Um, and uh, about 51 years ago, I met a guy who was in Berkeley High, Steve Wasserman, and uh, we've been active for many years in many different things. But we share a deep, a deep solidarity with the Cuban process, and an interest in the history of Cuba. And um, so, briefly, I, I, was the I was a member of the 1st Vencer Amos Brigade, and we spent about two months cutting cane in, in, Havana, in Havana province. And then um, I came back on a boat, a, ca a converted cattle boat, up to Newfoundland um, and from Havana. And a very brief, very brief story, but I'm walking down the plank getting off the boat, and here comes Steve getting onto the boat because they're going back to Cuba for the second brigade. So we go back that far. This is 1970. And I met him in 68, as I said. So in, in those years, I've been very active doing a lot of things and, arrest, and Cuba, but also many other activities. And um, so he and I, Steve and I, participated in the 10th brigade together. And then both of us have traveled to Cuba many times over the years, uh, doing different things. And in February, I attended the book fair in Havana, um, and I was there for two or three, three weeks, something like that. And I'm a bookseller, I'm an activist, so I bought a lot of books, um, and I came back, and, and I've done this before, and spent time with a very, very important uh, Cuban poet, Nancy Morejon, who's a dear friend of ours. Uh, who also uh, kind of really gives you a real sense of, of Havana in ways that is sort of off the beaten path. So that's been 
quite wonderful. And then Steve was in Cuba for 10 days about, what, two weeks ago? Four weeks ago. Four weeks ago. And, End of June. And that, so Steve also is the director of Heyday Books in Berkeley. He has a long history career with various publishing houses. He also was an editor of the LA Times Review of Books at one point. He worked very closely with Warren Hinkle, who you all may know or may not, but also Robert Shear and, and many other people. And as a director of Heyday, he has um, done things such as publishing an incredibly important book about People's Park, uh, another very important book of writings by Warren Hinkle, various other books that are coming out. And it, the, book, the press is going strong. Um, it's a actually very beautiful space down on San Pablo Avenue, about two blocks over from San Pablo and University. And um, so um, I'd like to just basically go through this. Steve's going to give a presentation about his experience, and then he and I are briefly going to interchange, and then we'll have a discussion. So I'd like to present to you my old friend, Steve Wasserman. But at the, before I do that, I want to say that I'd like to dedicate this session to an incredibly important individual who died last week, a Cuban intellectual artist, writer, activist, Roberto Fernandez Retamar. And I had the pleasure of meeting him quite a while back, and I actually saw him in February. And he'd been <coughs> ill for quite some time, and, and there was a book party for him uh, at the Union of Artists and Writers, which I was able to attend. And he was born in 1930, and he died at, eight, at 89. Um, he was a graduate of the University of Havana in philosophy and letters. He was active in the revolutionary movement uh, against Batista in and out of the country. He had quite a history. Uh, he published poetry books, philosophy books, essay books, criticism. He was an editor of, he was the editor of Casa, Casa Magazine, which is a very important magazine journal, uh, Casa Las Americas, which is an, an incredibly important center uh, for all of the Americas, not only Cuban intellectuals and artists. Um, and then later, with the passing of Jaime Santa Maria, who was the first director of Casa Las Americas and founder, he became the director. And he served on that for many, many years. And as he was diagnosed with his illness, a new person came on named Jorge Fornet uh, to become the new director. So they were co-directors for several years. And finally, he passed a few week, uh, uh, last week. And I'd like to dedicate, and he was also, excuse me, he was a member of the Council of State, which are very important. Um, here's an intellectual uh, artist writer who was a member of the Council of State, which decided how Cuba moves forward and what they're doing. And I was very honored to have spent time with him and, and, and be, been able to interact with him. And so I'd like to dedicate this session to, to his history, his life, because his, his life was the, was the revolution. So with that, I'd like to introduce Steve Wasserman, my old friend. Thank you, Tony. I want to make sure everybody can hear me. Um, and if not, uh, you'll make some gesture and I'll raise my voice. Uh, and so I hope you'll all be able to hear me. Um, and a good deal of what I'm going to talk about uh, will necessarily, uh, as would be appropriate in any library dedicated to the works of Karl Marx, it will be rooted in historical context, because without that history, you can't fully appreciate uh, what is happening in Cuba today and what might likely happen in Cuba tomorrow, because as Marx once so famously remarked, the uh, weight of history often weighs on the brain of the living like a nightmare, and sometimes it uh, uh, weighs on the, on the brain that makes it possible for us to envision a new and more beneficent future. I have been thinking about Cuba for a long time. Uh, Fifty years ago, as Tony said, I went to Cuba with nearly 700 other young Americans, most of us of the political persuasion called the New Left, to cut sugarcane and to travel about the island over the course of the next eight weeks. And we did so to show solidarity with the beleaguered Cuban Revolution, to break the U.S. blockade of Cuba, and to insist on our constitutional right as American citizens to travel unimpeded to any country in the world. It was to be the first of 10 trips 
I would take to Cuba as variously activist, journalist, publisher over the next five decades. The most recent, just four weeks ago, when I spent 10 days in Havana, in part to say farewell to Pablo Armando Fernandez, uh, a wonderful poet, now 90, uh, and in failing health, a kind of Cuban uncle to me, whom I met when he was 40 and I just 17. I can never forget his remark made to me all those years ago when after a great deal of rum, he turned to me and said, tell me something, tell me anything, even if it's a lie. <laughs> Now, in 1970, having just graduated Berkeley High School, I, like most of those visiting Cuba then, tended to romanticize the Cuban Revolution. The very idea of Cuba, this rebel nation that had stood up to the colossus of the North, was seductive. Cuba's revolution, I have to say, seemed relatively untainted by the sort of repressiveness that had characterized East European communism. And at times, Fidel Castro's flamboyant Leadership appeared almost bohemian. He was given to unorthodox social experiments, such as schools in the countryside combining work and study. And he was apparently blessed with an admirable spontaneity of spirit. He was a welcome alternative that many of us found at the time to representatives of the bureaucracy and what many of us considered at the time the stale ideology of the sclerotic Soviet Union. Cuba had a glamour that many of my generation, myself included, found irresistible. Castro's quest to topple Cuba's strongman, Fulgencio Batista, captured the imagination of millions all over the world. And victory secured 60 years ago on January 1st, 1959, and we are meeting today only a few days after the anniversary of his audacious attack on the military barracks called Moncada in Santiago de Cuba, launched on July 26, 1953. That victory by the end of 1958 and on the precipice of New Year's Day of January 1st, 59, after only two years of urban insurrection and guerrilla warfare, catapulted the 32-year-old former lawyer and son of a wealthy landowner into the ranks of revolutionary stardom. After the catastrophes and crimes that had sullied the 1917 Bolshevik project, Castro seemed to herald something new. His was the first socialist revolution, after all, that had been made without the central participation of the Cuban Communist Party, and even, it appeared, against the party, although there were always some militants who were in sympathy with Castro's upstarts and who would assume prominent positions shortly after the revolution's triumph. Cuba's communists, it's worthwhile recalling, denounced him after the attack on the Makada as an adventurist and a putschist. But by the end of the decade, he stood at the head of a multi-layered movement seeking to topple the dictator and to remake Cuban society from top to bottom. And where all previous revolutionaries had seemed grimly puritanical, Castro's barbudos, the bearded ones, called for the growth of their facial hair during the 26 months or so they spent in the mountains, they appeared almost to be bohemians with guns. Democracy and radical reform were poised to replace dictatorship and social misery, and the world watched agog. Ten years later, Castro had survived innumerable attempts by the CIA to assassinate him, and the revolution, though besieged by a relentless American embargo, and efforts to make tight a diplomatic noose to cut off Havana's ties to other nations stood strong and defiant. And at that time, 50 years ago, as I think everyone in this room will well recall, the moral landscape of the United States seemed to many of us to have been shattered beyond repair. An unconscionable war was in progress in Indochina. Class and racial divisions were increasing in the country. Our economic system seemed intent on plundering the world's resources as fast as its multinational companies could devour them. And a single statistic told the tale. Americans were just 6% of the world's population while consuming something on the order of 60% of the world's resources. And to all this, the American experiment offered neither a new vision nor fundamental solutions.
While power in the United States and in the Soviet Union was in the hands of the old in Cuba, it was wielded by the young. By 1970, nearly half of Cuba's almost 10 million people were born after the revolution. Cuba had a history, it appeared, worth admiring and a future worth building, apparently having renounced materialism for a Spartan idealism. And for many, like myself in the new left, visiting Cuba was an opportunity to glimpse the liberated future and then return to the battle lines here at home, morally and politically replenished. It's perhaps hard, 50 years on from this remove, to apprehend the exhilaration that we felt when we thought of Cuba. But the hundreds of photographs, even thousands of photographs, taken of Fidel and his guerrillas as they made their 500-mile victory march up the island central highway from Santiago de Cuba at the base of the Sierra Maestra, where the, the rural war was mostly fought, to Havana, capture something of the excitement that electrified people all over the world. They show Castro and his men, weary with fatigue, with near disbelief stamped on their youthful faces, being met by a thronging populace beside itself with ardor as they rolled through province after province, city after city, en route to the nation's capital to proclaim their mastery of the island. Eyes dance with hope, the radiant future beckons, and history is on the move, bursting with possibility and promise. The tyrant is gone, and revolutionary idealism is palpable. Today, it's all but impossible to gaze at these pictures of armed campesinos, the peasants, many of them still young boys, barely able to boast peach fuzz on their faces as they sprawl about the lobby of the newly occupied and recently built Hilton Hotel, promptly dubbed the Havana Libre, by which name it is still known, without thinking of some of the heartbreak that was to come in the years ahead. And these heady and early days, preserved in innumerable photographs, are filled with Sunday patriots, city girls flirting with shy peasants, M1 carbines strapped to their backs, a general, if happy, chaos engulfing a people in almost libidinous tumult, even as Fidel, Fidel seeks to hold a disparate movement together by the sheer force of his Leonine personality and his demonstrated and widely admired willingness to risk his life in the fight against the dictatorship. Vast numbers of people assembled in every city he entered, chanting Fidel, Fidel, in crowds, according to one witness, parting before him and closing behind him like Moses passing through the Red Sea. He seemed the incarnation of a legendary hero surrounded by an aura of magic, a veritable Parsifal, who had brought miraculous deliverance to an ailing Cuba. It was, of course, Castro's extraordinary eloquence, his strength of character, and unyielding commitment to action that drew men and women alike to his side. And it was this striking element, an element that still infuses many of the photographs of the young Fidel with a nearly radioactive charge, palpable after all these years, that caused many observers to regard him as a dangerous extremist, even as they acknowledged the man's magnetism. Others, like the Argentine Ernesto Che Guevara, were drawn to him, although Che originally viewed Castro's movement as bourgeois, even while conceding that it was led by a man, and here I quote, whose image is enhanced by personal qualities of extraordinary brilliance. Later, Fidel's willingness to embrace ever more radical solutions, when necessary, would continually surprise and please Che as much as it dismayed the movement's moderates. To understand Cuba's appeal, we need to summon up, how to put it, the Greek god Eros, the sheer vitality of this revolution that came to be. He was virile, glamorous, to use an old-fashioned word, in a word, sexy. He relied less on Marxist dogma than on photogenesis to capture the minds and hearts of millions. He was, as one observer later wrote, an almost Tolstoyan figure in the profusion of his exuberance and imagination among all the premiers and statesmen of the world, he was at least the one figure who seemed unquestionably tumultuously alive. Not only were Castro and his Barbudos better looking than the corrupt politicians and gangsters they overthrew, they knew it. 
and it was easy to see on the evidence of the many iconic photographs of the period how it was a golden legend arose. The history of every revolution is always a battle of cliches. And in Cuba's case, the commonly accepted narrative reduces the Cuban revolution to a romantic fable of the charismatic Castro and his 12 apostles and the landing of the yacht grandma into which Fidel stuffed 82 people, a boat built to hold no more than about two dozen. They landed, as you may recall, at the end of December 1956, immediately detected by Batista's forces, strafed, napalmed, shot at, many of them killed, others dispersed. Guevara hit in the neck, thought he was going to bleed to death, as he later recounted in his memoirs, Reminiscences of a Revolutionary War, the one thing he could think of as he was bleeding out was Jack London's story, Fire, about a man who is, is, who is uh, facing his death in the bitter ice, icy, uh, ice and snow of the Yukon during the Klondike. And that's all he can think of when a comrade, I, I believe it was Camilo, turned to him and said, on, on, at this battle, no one here dies, least of all you. <laughs> and later, the survivors gathered together in the redoubt in the Sierra Maestra. There weren't 12 of myth. There were some 19 people. And astonishingly, to everyone's amazement, Fidel looks at them all and says, on this day is the first day of Batista's defeat. He was either mad or he was an incredible leader. Well, these numbers begin to multiply faster than uh, players in a pyramid scheme, and after having survived the rigors of guerrilla warfare, they broke the back of a regime as brutal as it was corrupt. The myth was in part of Castro's own making. What's indisputable is that by December 1958, his rebel army of just 400 armed men and women had defeated a government that fielded a vastly superior force of 40,000. Or perhaps more precisely, in the face of mounting civil strife, Batista's feared secret police that had murdered and tortured an estimated 20,000 people. And remember, Cuba's population at that time was 6 million. You rem just to fast forward, you remember the grievous wound suffered by our people with the loss of 55,000 troops killed in Vietnam in a country millions of millions and millions of people. Here, 20,000 people in a population of 6 million, while Castro's rural army suffered probably less, aside from the initial attacks of Moncada and the Grandma Landing, probably less than 40 dead. Batista's political support vanished. Washington's confidence in him crumbled. His will to power collapsed. And so, in time-honored fashion, the despot fled his suffering island in the middle of the night, stuffing his suitcases with millions of stolen dollars, an estimated 300 billion, to live out the remainder of his life in the baronial manner to which he had become accustomed. He died in Portugal in 1973. By contrast, Castro appeared to be an authentic reformer, determined to break with the discredited image of Cadillos, who battened on the miseries of ordinary Cubans while kowtowing to U.S. interests. Fidel was keen to radically transform Cuba, to rid it of the corruptions of the past, to diversify the economy by breaking the stranglehold of tobacco and sugar, and restore the 1940 Constitution. His zeal to remake Cuba was seen by sympathizers initially as a patriotic project, less to do with Karl Marx than with Jose Marti, the founding father of the country and its apostle of independence. It was a posture that won him many adherents, especially among the men and women of Cuba's upper middle class and middle class, whose political aspirations had been thwarted by Batista's March 52 coup. As for Fidel's anti-Yankee sentiments, he came by them honestly, as he would recount in a letter to Celia Sanchez, his confidant and uh, the daughter of a dentist and his chief courier to the urban underground. He wrote of his anger toward the United States. This was during the guerrilla war. He wrote, and I quote, when I saw the rockets that they fired on Mario's house, I swore that the Americans are going to pay dearly for what they are doing. When this is 
when this war is over, I'll start a much longer and bigger war of my own, the war I'm going to fight against them. The long near Talmudic debate over when and how Castro became a communist is largely, in my judgment, beside the point. What was clear from the start was the man's radical disposition and his refusal to be cowed into a complacent reformism. His defining ideological characteristic was his implacable anti-imperialism. His sympathies were plain. As a college student, he bought, and here I quote from his letters, most of the classics of Marxist literature in the Cuban Communist Party bookstore on Calle Carlos III. And while he found himself in accord with many of the party's goals, he despaired of its rampant sectarianism. He condemned its, quote, ghetto mentality. In addition, the party was tainted in the eyes of many Cubans by its willingness during the United Front period to collaborate with Batista and to serve in his government. Fidel was careful not to prematurely proclaim the socialist character of his ultimate goal. He was cunning. Confessing years later to Lee Lockwood, the gifted American photojournalist and one of his most acute interlocutors, that, quote, to have said that our program was Marxist-Leninist or communist would have awakened many prejudices. It is possible that there was some moment when I appeared less radical than I really was. It is possible, too, that I was more radical than even I myself knew. More, if you ask me whether I considered myself a revolutionary at the time I was in the mountains, I would say yes. If you asked me, did I consider myself a Marxist-Leninist, I would say no. Now, Castro had not only to be certain of the support of a majority of the island's people, but also a majority of his comrades. He later recalled, quote, having to do some heavy arguing, even among the militants of the 26th of July movement, it couldn't have been easy. As Fidel said, there was also competition, rivalry among the leadership, and you had to keep your eye on all of that. And it was a rare admission of the difficulty of keeping together the many often conflicting strands of the various factions that made up the opposition to Batista while constantly demanding fealty to his personal leadership. For in addition to the clash of personalities and the differences in temperaments of the various men who vied to head the movement to oust Batista, it was also riven by ideological differences, differences that had their origin in the diverging strategies and priorities of those who fought in the mountains and those who fought in the cities. The seeds of future conflicts and defections after Castro's triumph are in the contradictions of class which to a very considerable extent would mark both the struggle against Batista and the years following his overthrow during which Castro consolidated his revolution. Many who helped to make the revolution would later break with him. The list of ex-fidelistas is long. I can give you names, some of them you will recognize. Uber Matos, Annabel Escalante, David Salvador, Eloy Gutierrez Menoyo, Carlos Franchi, Guillermo Cabrera Infante, Heberto Padilla, among many others. Some would flee, others would be expelled, still others would be imprisoned. The anti-Batista resistance was made up of men as diverse as Che Guevara, who insisted that, quote, the solution of the world's problems lies behind the so-called Iron Curtain, and Rene Ramos Latour, a leader of the movement's under urban underground, who castigated Guevara in a letter for thinking it possible, quote, to free ourselves from the noxious Yankee domination by means of a no less noxious Soviet domination. The urban wing was composed mostly of middle class moderates, many of whom would feel betrayed by Castro when he explicitly embraced socialism in 1961, following the victory over the U.S. back Bay of Pigs invasion. The guerrilla army on the other hand, drew upon the peasantry, the revolution's chief beneficiaries and most vigorous defenders. The old debate over whether Castro was an opportunist with a hidden socialist agenda or a social democrat and Cuban patriot forced by the enmity of the United States into accepting the Soviet Union's help as the price of the revolution's survival hardly matters at this remove. It is clear from the abundant public and 
private record, only some of which has come to light in recent years, that Fidel always regarded himself as a radical visionary and nationalist whose politics were shaped more by the writings of Marti and Bolivar than by Marx and Lenin. Even though he would proclaim the revolution's ideology as Marxist-Leninist, in a speech delivered in East Berlin in 1977, he embarrassed his rather more orthodox host by declaring, quote, I still don't know to what extent I'm still a utopian and to what extent I've become a Marxist-Leninist. Perhaps I may even be a bit of a dreamer. He was, of course, familiar with and admired both Marx and Lenin. In letters that he wrote while in prison in the Isle of Pines, serving a 15-year sentence for his failed attack on the Moncada, Batista would grant him amnesty after less than two years in jail. He wrote, quote, Marx and Lenin each had a weighty polemical spirit, and I have to laugh. It is fun, and I have a good time reading them. They would not give an inch, and they were dreaded by their enemies. He was enthralled by, quote, the magnificent spectacle offered by the great revolutions of history. They have always meant the victory of the huge majority's aspirations for a decent life and happiness over the interests of a small group. He longed, as he wrote, to revolutionize Cuba, quote, from one end to the other, and he relished the prospect, vowing, quote, I would not be stopped by the hatred and ill will of a few thousand people, including some of my relatives, half the people I know, two-thirds of my fellow professionals, and four-fifths of my schoolmates. Wow. He read voraciously. He was particularly taken with the life of Napoleon and Robespierre, whom he considered an honest idealist. Quote, the French Revolution was in danger. The frontiers surrounded by enemies on all sides, traitors ready to plunge a dagger into one's back. The fence sitters were blocking the way. One had to be harsh, inflexible, tough. It was better to go too far than not go far enough because everything might have been lost. The few months of the terror were necessary to do away with a terror that had lasted for centuries. In Cuba, we need more Robespierre's. But Castro was never a terrorist. He disavowed terrorism as a tactic of revolutionary war. In this, he remained consistent all his long life. As a matter of fact, Cuba was the first country to condemn the 9-11 attackers and to express sympathy and solidarity with US citizens. Castro said at that time, no war is ever won through terrorism. Neither the theorists of our wars of independence nor any Marxist-Leninist that I know of advocated assassination or terrorist-style acts, acts in which innocent people might be killed. That's not contemplated in any revolutionary doctrine. Ethics is not simply a moral issue. If ethics is sincere, it produces results. The Cuban Revolution harbored huge ambitions. It sought not merely to overthrow a single dictator, but to alter the habits of a nation's entire cultural and political economy. Fidel and his comrades knew they would have to vanquish a notion of Cuba that had lodged itself firmly in the North American imagination. And that would prove to be a Herculean task. Cuba, for Americans, had long been a location of fantasy, escape, and reinvention. After the economic panic of 1893, plunged the United States into a widespread depression, thousands of jobless men emigrated to Cuba to seek their fortune, seeing in Cuba, as the advertising campaigns of the time proclaimed, a virgin land, a new California, a veritable Klondike of wealth. By, by 1898, having won its bloody contest with Spain, Cuba was prostrate, its treasury depleted, the countryside devastated, its people destitute. The United States, which had helped deliver the coup de grace to Spain, quickly moved to take advantage of the island's desperate plight. America's market reach and economic clout proved irresistible. Already in the early 1850s, Americans had completed the first gas works in Havana. In the 1860s, Cuban students returning from American universities and colleges brought baseball to the island a game that was quickly embraced by Cubans as a way to disassociate themselves from the Spanish obsession with the bullfight. In the 1880s, Americans built the first ice factory in Havana and inaugurated a telephone service, then introduced electricity, which forever changed the nightlife of Havana. 
Everyday objects of U.S. origin came to be ubiquitous in Cuban life. Woven wire mattresses, clocks, cameras, coffee pots, sewing machines, furniture, even a tool so quintessentially Cuban as the machete was not of Cuban manufacture. It was supplied by the Collins Company of Hartford, Connecticut. <laughs> Indeed, in the Cuban vernacular, the machete was often called in the way that we would later call a copy machine a Xerox machine. They would call the machete the Collins. You pick up a Collins. For many Cubans at the turn of the century, 